Well, hey, welcome to the Music Money Podcast. Today, I am excited to have a special guest, Levi Burwell. Levi is an artist development consultant, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, entrepreneur, and author who earned a four-year presidential scholarship to the prestigious Berklee College of Music and graduated in 2017 with a degree in music business. He is the author of the book, Groundwork for Artists, which is referred to as the new blueprint for growing a fan base. In the book, he shows you how to start laying the groundwork for your artist's career so you can achieve attainable goals that align with your creative vision. Levi, welcome to the Music Money Podcast. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Barry. Oh, my pleasure. Well, well, first of all, before we dive in, because you've got a lot of great stuff to cover, uh, I'd really like to get a little bit of your background. Where, where, do, where did you grow up? Yeah, definitely. So I actually grew up in a very rural, small town uh, in Ohio. It's called Ottawa. And so I, I always tell people, if you know where Detroit is, and south of that is Toledo, Ohio. A little bit farther south is Bowling Green, Bowling Green State University. And then we're like 45 minutes south of that. So very okay. small town. That's funny. I actually just got back from uh, Oberlin. Are okay. you familiar with Oberlin? Yeah, my, my, my daughter is uh, very keen on going to college at Oberlin uh, College. So she we just got back from there last week. And the thing that just freak me out now that's that's extremely north ohio mm-hmm. and it's august and we got out i'm like oh god i need to be wearing pants and a jacket it's <laughs> so weird and it's august i'm in florida where you know when i left it was 92 degrees with a heat yeah. index of 110 and it's like you know it was just so weird it's like wow it just, it being right there on those great lakes man that that cool air comes off of there that makes a huge difference definitely being being right next to the great lakes so, okay. So you're, you're in small town, Ohio. So when did you start playing music? Um, probably when I was about four or five. Um, I think I remember coming down on Christmas morning and there was a guitar behind the recliner <laughs> waiting nice. for me. Um, nice. they, they set that present aside, but, um, grew up very musical family. My dad played, um, all of his siblings played my mom and her siblings all played and marched in drum corps, um, when they grew up. So it was kind of always around me. Um, So it was very young, about four or five years old. Okay. So do you just play guitar or do you play other instruments? So I played guitar at first, guitar and drums, I would say, and then gradually learned piano. I actually went to Berkeley on trombone. That's what I got my presidential scholarship on. Nice. Um, So did a lot of jazz bands, a lot of big band stuff, swing music, um, and then ended up playing that at Berkeley. I played bass and sang in a rock band back home in Ohio. Nice. Um, so we played a bunch of different venues around our hometown. Um, so yeah, I recently started teaching myself the mandolin. <laughs> so, so anytime I hear trombone, we actually, we, we did have a trombone player. I don't know if you know about my band. We're a, an eight piece funk band with a three piece horn section. Awesome. And, and for many years we had a, a trombone player. We actually did. We, we kind of switched that out with the baritone sax. Mm-hmm. So having graduated with, you know, that's kind of situation in Berkeley, you're probably could saying you could probably handle my gig. I, I think you could probably handle it. <laughs> yeah. Just give me a call. <laughs> yeah. Sight reading, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that's the thing that, that has amazed me with horn players since we, cause I, I didn't know anything about, you know, charts, uh, that kind of stuff. I mean, I knew about mm-hmm. charts, but I didn't know that when I started a horn funk band, it was mm-hmm. like the expectation was, Hey, uh, dude, where, where's the chart? Yeah. You know, so they'd show up to the gig and, and these guys, these cats can all sight read really, really well, Definitely, and, but that's their expectation. And so it was like, and charts are expensive too, man. It's like, yeah. so I, you know, we needed like, I guess it would have been around 35, 40 songs to be able to even get a gig. Right. You know, and, yeah. and the three, four hour stuff. gigs, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and these charts were like, I can't remember what I was paying at the time. It was like, 20 bucks a piece or something like that. And I was, no like, I was doing the math and I'm like, Oh my God, there's no way I can do this. And wow. I ended up finding a guy that had like this big, massive catalog of charts uh-huh. and it was like 500 bucks, but it had almost every song in it that I wanted to do and a bunch of other stuff that was actually pretty interesting. So I have thousands of charts that I bought for like, but that was, <laughs> it was kind of a rude awakening, but, but it was cool because, you know, I mean, the skill level that these guys have. Cause I mean, I can read music, but just not very well. I play well, bass. Definitely. I mean, and here's the thing I think with horn players too, is I think most of the time you could probably just save money by having them right out the charts. Cause 
because they're used to sight reading and they're used to being yeah. given so many different types of charts, they probably have their own way of wanting to see it. Yeah, um, we actually tried that in the beginning but... <laughs> funny, with a guy that played trombone. His name was his, his well, not his actual name. Surprise, surprise was James DeBone. Um, <laughs> you ought to look him up, though. He's a, he's a smoking hot uh, trombone player. I mean, he's <laughs> really got that New Orleans uh, sound. He was with a he, with a band until recently called Ari and the Alibis, and they okay. um, got this really sexy female lead singer uh-huh. that can sing her ass off, and a guy that was just blazing hot on trombone. Really nice. interesting kind of ska sound. Uh, they're another local band that, you know, friends of ours. but anyway, but I, no, it's, it's funny. I, I didn't realize, I didn't know you were, uh, big on the bone like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I got to Berkeley and I, they threw me in so because of my scholarship, they threw me in so many different ensembles at college. Mm, yeah. Um, and just on scholarship, they, they needed a trombone player for this one or a trombone player for that one. And I, it kind of burnt me out a little bit. Um, mm. and so I think by probably my third year of college, um, getting closer to when I graduated, I just dove my head into, dove my head into the music business part and just focused on music business. So, nice. um, okay. So that, eventually, that from what I understand that led to you heading to Nashville. I mean, yeah. So why did you, why Nashville? What, what made you make that move? It's a pretty bold move. So when I got to Berkeley, um, it was definitely a bit of a culture shock for me coming from a town of 4,000 people graduated with a hundred and that was the largest town in a 30 mile radius, um, going to a city like Boston, that was immediate, just, you know, a a wall of sound in in the form of culture shock. And so I I always kind of had it in mind if I was going to go to one of the music cities, it would probably be Nashville because it's got the best of both worlds. It has that small town vibe, but it's still a city. Obviously it's, you know, music city. Um, it's got music real with all the companies because I wanted to do music business. Um, like all my friends that were producers and writers were going out to LA, less people were going to New York. So I figured, you know, Nashville is probably the place for me. And, um, okay. So when you got to Nashville, then you said you really wanted to focus on the music business. It seemed like people would have their act together. Is that what you found or was it something yeah, else? So when I first got to Nashville, I started songwriting a bunch. That was my first thing. Um, I've always songwritten since I started playing instruments and, I knew that I wanted to songwrite in some capacity. So when I got down here, I started playing writers rounds, started meeting artists and songwriters that were playing in town. And eventually when a few of them started cutting the songs that I had written with them, I realized that they didn't really have much of a strategy for marketing, marketing their music other than what the hype has been the past few years of, I'm just going to get on as many uh, Spotify playlists as possible. And that's going to be my marketing strategy. Um, And then I had the realization that's not really working. So, so that's when I started researching, kind of observing the local artists that were being successful, that, that were having success and saying, okay, what are they doing differently? Cause they're not just playlisting. They're not just trying to get on a bunch of playlists and that's it. Um, yeah. and so eventually I started doing that, started working with, a couple artists to try to see, okay, let's, let's just try this, see if it works. Let's try this, see if it works. And eventually had all this research and all of this, all these notes and spreadsheets and decided to turn it into a book. So interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, in your book, you lay out a blueprint. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, what's, what's the purpose of having a blueprint? Why would, why would that be something that you feel like somebody would need? Definitely. So I'd like to think of, Groundwork for Artists is a marketing roadmap for independent artists. So obviously being an independent artist is super overwhelming. And, you know, there's so many things to keep track of aside from actually being the artist writing, recording and performing, Um, you know, so I did turn it into, you know, a 10 step blueprint so that each step, the way it's laid out, they, they each build on top of the last one. Um, so for instance, an artist needs to define their brand before they can put out branded content. They need to put out branded content before they can start paying for advertisements to attract people to that branded content, because otherwise they're going to come, th- those, those people that they're trying to target are going to come back to an identity crisis or just random posts thrown here and there. Um, so it, it was kind of, you know, step-by-step step, here's how to implement it 
And once they're all working in tandem, the 10 steps, it does, it really does build a solid foundation that, you know, you can actually attract an audience and grow a fan base and sell tickets, sell merchandise, um, generate an income through those things. So you can have a sustainable career. Um, if that so makes sense. You yeah. Kinda, yeah, it does. It, when you kind of hit a little bit on, on the mindset that, that you found with some of the artists in Nashville, it was, you know, I'm just going to playlist and that's, that's the name of the game. Right. And, uh, in fact, you kind of describes some different, a great mindset and not so great mindset that you see with artists. Can you kind of shed a little light on, on what you kind of see going on right now in the, in the play, in the market? Yeah, definitely. I think it's similar to social media in general. I think most artists are looking at numbers alone and they're using that as their only metric of success. So they are trying to get on every playlist possible. They're just trying to increase their follower count, even if that means going through bots, the mm. fake followers, um, trying to get as many streams as possible on a song through bot driven playlists, um, instead of just ditching those, the shortcuts, if you will, and actually, you know, nurturing a fan base the right way, you know, defining your brand, making sure that you are, you know, setting an actual image that people want to latch onto. So let, let's talk about branding. I mean, because that's that's probably overwhelming for a for an artist to start when they start off. You know, what is how do you even start off with the, with or have a figure out what your brand is? I mm-hmm. mean, are there any kind of tips that you could you could give somebody who's new? They really don't know. I mean, they may have a sound. Yeah, they don't definitely. have a look or they don't have a an aesthetic. What I always tell artists is that they should first try to create an artist story. And so they should draw from inspiration from their past experiences, their upbringing, um, those types of things to, to actually get a story of who they are and who they want to portray themselves as the artist. And from there, you know, go, go on somewhere like Pinterest and just start looking at, okay, what actually can you see when you listen to your music? A good example I always I always throw out is Ariana Grande. Her brand looks like what her music sounds like. If you yeah. look at her album cover or if you listen to her song, you're seeing her aesthetic. You're seeing the clothes that she wears, the colors that she has on social media. It all kind of goes together. So I say just go on Pinterest, turn your music on, and start picking out the things that, that attract you. You know, it's funny, as you were saying that I didn't, I don't, I'd like to s- say that I did this intentionally, but I really didn't, but um, just full divulgence there. But <laughs> uh, we have um, a promotion that's been going on, ongoing for us for a long time, um, where people can get our CD for free, just pay the shipping and handling. And, and we've sold thousands and thousands of CDs that way. Um, and I have an email that goes out the first thing when they first get it. Mm-hmm. And it says, who who in the heck are Reverend Barry and the funk, yeah. you know, and, it, and what it is, it's our story, but it's our story and it's told in a way it's a little bit of a rant, but not mm-hmm. in a douchebaggy kind of way. It's basically, yeah. you know, cause I'm, I have a few years on you in case you didn't notice, um, you know, but the, our average listener are guys that, that are my age, a little bit older, maybe a little mm-hmm. bit younger. Um, and they can remember a time when bands, you know, in the seventies had horn sections, you know, I mean, because if you really sit and think about it, there's, I mean, Stevie Wonder, uh, but even like, you know, Huey Lewis in the news, there's so many of these, these older groups mm-hmm. that, you know, uh, Hall and Oates, you know, if you listen to some of these, the stuff in the, actually, I mean, God, you can go all the way back to the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Chicago, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire. Yeah, yeah. Groups like that. But even, not even that. I mean, sometimes, you know, like even Genesis had some songs that had some yeah. horns in it and stuff. And, um, so I go on this big rant about, you know, how record labels don't give bands record deals anymore. I mean, and it's, it's crazy if you really think about it. I mean, some of the most po- popular bands, like even in the nineties, Huey Lu- or, um, Hootie and the Blowfish, U2, um, you know, and then in the seventies, of course, Fleetwood Mac, all these, all these, they were bands, they were groups that yeah. had, you know, and, and I, so I, I talk about that and I, I talk about, well, you know, 
we're, I mean, yes, we're a funk band. We're also a, we also have a big sound, you know, we have a Hammond B3. We've got a, we've got a Wurlitzer. We've got a Rhodes. We've got female singers. We, we do lots of backup vocals and all this stuff in our originals. And our, our production is very full. You know, and if you listen to that, those sounds of the 70s and, and the sound of the 80s and especially groups like Earthman and Fire and all the types of stuff that had that big sound, you know, it's Definitely. kind of that, you know, that that wall of sound kind of vibe. And I said, and so we're bringing that back. Gotcha. If you want yeah. to come on board with us, you know, enjoy the ride. That, that's yeah. that kind of thing. And, and that's our story. It Love really it. is. It, you know, it's not about me. It's not about my deep lyrics or any of that kind of stuff it's it's really it's about the music it's about the fact that we play real instruments and it's if you about like the bands, audience and, and their experience having listened to those bands too as soon as you send that email immediately they, they have nostalgia you know thinking of what they they love to use to listen to and yeah, i mean we started as a cover in. band just playing that kind of music but of course we started as a dance band because people you know the good thing is that people really love to dance to september by earth one and fire i mean even even bruno mars you know with uptown funk kind of brought that sound back and he's even he's doing it even more with the new stuff that he's putting out um you know it has even more of a retro vibe but you know our thing is just like you know we're all about playing real instruments real singers real harmonies yeah. You know, no auto tune, that kind of <laughs> stuff. And I don't really diss on those types of groups. I just know that my, my demographic, that really resonates with them. And it's the truth. It's, it's authentic. You know, so I think that that authenticity, and that's the first message that they see for me. Absolutely. It's all about that, you know, so, and then after that, I'll, I'll put out like emails to talk about, in fact, I just did one last week that here's my top 13 favorite albums of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, only one of them is funk. And then yeah. here's some of my others. And I mean, I go and I've got some heavy metal bit, stuff in there. I've got some, you know, Radiohead's Kid A, which is a completely weird uh-huh. record, you know, but, but there it's all about, you know, cause it, it's about the music and a lot of it's some old school, but not all of it. But anyway. Yeah, definitely. So, and, and like you said, what you're doing is you're, you're creating a brand and it, that brand involves, you know, it includes the influences that you have, the inspiration that you draw from. And I think, if you know that your demographic or your psychographic is, you know, they like the same thing, then they're, they're going to latch on. So. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, okay. Now I thought this was interesting. So you talked about, you talk in the book about an artist's ecosystem. I hadn't really heard that before. How, how, what's an artist's ecosystem? So I like to think of it as their online world of websites and social media platforms, streaming services, and their profiles on streaming services, and how those are connected. So, you know, if if a random Joe Schmo stumbles upon an artist's post or an advertisement or their music, or maybe they saw them at a live show and now they go to look them up online, an artist wants to make sure that that person, that person that Joe Schmo can navigate their socials and immediately get to the music, immediately get to the merch or immediately get to their website. Um, and if there's any hiccups, I mean, you, you know, if you're scrolling yeah. and you have a hiccup or something doesn't load correctly, or if it's something way outdated, you just move on to the next thing, you know, you, you just scroll past. So it's, it's all that, all those different websites connected. And then on top of that, it's the underlying metadata. Um, so it's a little bit of SEO. Um, so all that metadata, as long as it's correct and organized and clean, then it's going to trigger things like, you know, if you bring the artist up on Google, that artist's music is going to be right there. Their socials are going to be right there. Um, all because you just had some basic organization of organizing your metadata, making sure it all is clean and cohesive. So. Yeah. So as you're, as you're saying that I can, I can feel my skin crawling just a little bit because I have a funny feeling that, you know, some of my website, maybe some of my links aren't quite work. I already know that <laughs> I've got like two merch platforms. I've got, uh, I've got WooCommerce over here and I got Shopify over here and I really yeah. don't want to get rid of Shopify, but I really need to and move it all over. I'm sure there's some broken links. So, um, w- do you have something to help somebody that's like, look, I, you know, I know I need to fix this stuff, but I need to keep it organized. Is that kind of what's your book? Is that one of the things? Definitely. I, yeah, there's, there's a few different, I guess, bullet points, if you will, of, 
of what you can do to to try to clean up your ecosystem um, and put it in a position where it's going to trigger good SEO. It's going to trigger people being able to find what they need to find when they when they stream your music or when they see you at a live show or when they get that email. Um, and it really is just an organization overhaul, even something like copyrights and making sure that your PRO registrations are correct and all that kind of metadata. It's all stuff that subconsciously artists really stress out about when they, Mm -hmm. when they look at an artist's career and they start getting really overwhelmed at the business aspect of it. It's really those finite details like, you know, metadata and copyrights and royalty registrations and, links and making sure, making sure things are connected. So they're in the book they, yeah, there's step-by-step step of what you can do to clean up that ecosystem. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, cause as I'm hearing you talk, it's like, you know, I always tell people, it's like, you know, the cool thing about the music business right now, you know, this is the music money podcast is you can, you can go direct to fans. Mm-hmm. You don't need a record label. That's, you know, that's kind of like a lot of artists kind of know that they've, they've heard that before. You don't necessarily even need an independent record label. I mean, it would, might, might help, but what, but that's also the bad news because it means that you have to do everything yourself. Yeah. And you know, th- those little ticky tacky things. And I think what, with what's your book. And as I, as I read through it, it was, I, I like the fact that it, it was, it was step-by-step. Step. It's like, these are the things that are most important. Focus on the, don't worry about that yet. Let's focus on this for now. Yeah. And then it's just one built on the other. Um, you know, so, so a content is a big piece and that's the one again, that I think I struggle with. It's just like, gee, what interesting, what's, what's interesting that I have to say today? What, you know, I, what selfie can I post? You know, that, that kind of thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not into that, even though I'm a yeah. marketing guy. Um, you know, the, I do content, I do struggle with the content of keep, keeping constant content. Um, I mean, how important is that? I mean, what's, I, what's an idea of, of artists that do it badly and artists that do it well? What do you think? Definitely. I think that it's extremely important, important nowadays. Um, I think that, if an artist isn't posting every day or every other day, um, then that's, I think that's a big decision-making factor for a potential fan. If they stumble upon an artist's social media, because we all live on social media, that's where we keep track of artists and our favorite music for the most part. Then I think that they're, you know, they're going to be more likely to scroll past if, if they don't see that the artist is active on there. Um, I think it's just part of how the music industry has changed and how, uh, business has changed, but definitely a content strategy. I mean, that's direct marketing one-on-one right there. You, yeah. you have your fans right there at your disposal and they're going to see that post as soon as they get on social media. Um, and if you're doing it every day, that's you just in their ear all the time in front of their, in front of their eyes. Um, so the more you do it, I think the more that they can latch on. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny when you're saying that I, I was thinking about, there was a band back before, I think I even started this one. We've been together about eight years, but we've been real hot, heavy on Facebook for f- since the very beginning, probably the two year or two before I remember distinctly that there was this band that was very similar to ours. It was a horn band, you know, um, funk, good, you know, guys, singer and everything. And they had a music video they put out. They were called Gooseneck. That was the name of the band. Okay. Not a bad name. And um, the tune was pretty good. And I remembered it went viral somewhat. I can't remember if it was an ad or if it was just a post that was getting shared. But it made it around to me. I shared it. I thought it was pretty good. I thought they were a good band. It was just one of those in the studio videos, you know, very typical. Mm-hmm. And so they had all this virality going on. And then... <sighs> I think for a while, I remember seeing some posts that they were doing. They really must have been big Steely Dan fans. They were like talking about, oh, Steely Dan and da, 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 da. And then I didn't hear anything else from them ever. Now, wow. for all I know, they broke up, um, you know, which happens. But I just, I always think about that as being, they were, they were a very similar music to ours. And ours, you know, our video has been seen well over three, four million times. Yeah. Um, you know, and it just because it gets constantly gets shared, but I constantly promote it or mm-hmm. videos, um, you know, and they had the opportunity. They were the same style of music, same fan base, mm-hmm. same everything, but they just stopped posting. 
Yeah. You know, and again, maybe they broke so, up. I don't know. Or maybe they broke up because they thought nobody was paying attention to them. But yeah. they were. So, you know, they could have it's, seen it in the metrics. It's crazy. It, it really is. I think people, because attention spans are so short today, that something like that, if somebody stops, if an artist stops posting, then it, it's not easy or it's not difficult for their fan base to forget or for the people that follow them to forget about them. They'll probably, there's probably people that still follow them today and don't even realize that they're following the page because yeah. they just, it's easy to forget. So. Yeah. Like if you go, like if you look deep in the recesses of Facebook <laughs> yeah. and you go into your pages, you follow and you're like, yep. wow, you know, back when I was into that or back, you know, I mean, it's like a walk back in time. It's Facebook yeah. getting kind of long in the tooth. I mean, it's they've been around for many years. Yeah. I know what I see posted nine years ago and I still had <laughs> back when my hair was a lot darker uh, yeah. you know after a while I'm like hey Facebook stop showing me that stop crap. showing me that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> back when my kids were still babies yeah. now they're getting out going to college um, but uh, okay so now content is different than engagement what what does a successful engagement look like I mean what, what maybe let's define that definitely so I think engagement when, when I think of engagement, I'm thinking of proactively reaching out and following and engaging with new fans. So mm-hmm. commenting on their posts and liking their posts, you know, sending them a message like, Hey, I see you do this too. Like if you can relate to them, for example. Um, I also see it as using good hashtags that are going to show up on, you know, their explore page. Uh, for, yeah. for potential fans, they, they might be following a certain hashtag that it, if they see that artist post, if it grabs their attention, they'll, they'll become a fan or they'll become a follower. Um, so proactively trying to reach out directly to uh, new potential fans in the form of you know, a direct interaction or just liking and commenting. Um, so that sort of thing. OK, yeah, because I, I don't think some people I mean, a hashtags that was. I remember I didn't even know what a hashtag was. And when I first discovered Twitter, again, this has been many years ago now, you know, I was like, what the heck is a hashtag? You know, and, and, yeah. I, and, and, but that was the first platform that I can recall that was really driven by hashtags. Mm-hmm. And then I, so I started understanding that. And then of course, Instagram, very much driven by hashtags as yeah. far as being able to get free traffic from ha- people that follow certain hashtags. But TikTok, I mean, it's that's the name of the game, pretty much. Yeah. TikTok, right? Definitely. Um, in fact, I even heard somebody say that that uh, TikTok they will give you two hundred views. They'll just show your show your video to two hundred people just randomly yeah. to see if your video will happen to go viral. Which is the that's polar opposite what I heard of Facebook. too. I think. Yeah, exactly, definitely, and and that's what I heard too. I I think somebody said that. TikTok, they'll show it to, you know, a certain number of random people. And that's how the vi- the viral sensations happen. It's a little bit, it's not all luck, but sometimes it is luck at who they actually show that video to. Because if those hundred people watch a certain percentage of the video, then they're probably going to send it to a hundred more or a thousand more. And it just yeah. has that snowball effect. Um, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, but alongside it's, that, definitely the hashtags. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all about the I mean, TikTok is all about things going viral. And it's it's almost like the algorithm is saying, hey, we're just an algorithm. Is this funny? Is this, you know, is this yeah. thought provoking? <laughs> is this cool? What do, what do you think? And exactly. those 200 people go, hey, now that's funny. And they and they share it. I mean, boom, yep. it, it blows up. And so, yeah, it's it's interesting. But at the we're same at, time, it does have, you know, there's there's a little bit of strategy that goes behind it, too, because I mm-hmm. think if if certain artists or just random you know, TikTok users in general, if they're keeping up with the trends, if they know how to catch somebody's attention in the first second, then if they're posting multiple times per day of those attention grabbing videos, combine that with the luck, combine that with the hashtags. I mean, that's going to put them in a more opportunistic position to go viral. Um, so there really is a little bit of strategy behind it. So what, you know, speaking of trends, I mean, there's been a few things that have come around. I mean, like you think Periscope, Periscope was a thing Mm -hmm. for a while, still exists, I guess. Twitch, (laughs) Twitch got really popular. I mean, Twitch has been around for years with video gamers, but, um, it just got real popular when the pandemic first hit. Uh, And now what do you think, is it, 
should an artist focus on one platform? Should they, I mean, it's, there's only so many hours in a day. Yeah. You know, how do they, how do they best use their time? Should they focus on these trendy platforms? You know, like TikTok at first, people were like, I don't know. What do you think about that? Definitely. So in my eyes, I think artists should primarily focus on three platforms and that's TikTok, Instagram, and keeping up with their Spotify. Um, I don't think, I think Twitter has gone a little bit past that or has moved on from that a little bit from, from the music world and is a little more centered around sports and maybe politics and, Mm -hmm. um, celebrities, um, that sort of thing. Facebook, I think Facebook goes a little bit alongside Instagram because you can post on Facebook and have it go to Instagram. If you want, um, you can do your advertising for both on Facebook. Um, but primarily I think if, if an artist can master and create a routine for posting content on Instagram and on TikTok, and then obviously keep up with their, their Spotify, um, and their streaming stuff, um, then that's, I think that's ball game. If they can, focus on those two, then that's a really good start. Uh, that's, that's great advice. Now I, we were, I don't want to get too far. I'll, I'll tend to go on rabbit trails. You got to watch me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, engagement, we were, we were talking about that and you brought up the topic of a street team. Okay. What the heck is a street team? I think of it as, and you can, I mean, maybe, you know, a little bit more on this too, but I think of a street team as just your closest, it can be your closest friends and family. It can be your biggest fans. Um, just the people that if you post something, no matter what it is, they're going to be commenting and giving you positive vibes and, and rooting for you. Um, so I think a street team is good for, for that, for engagement, for commenting on your posts, for liking your posts and kind of kickstarting that, that engagement. Um, eventually down the line, doing some, some deeper marketing things for you um, and actually going out on the street you know, where the term actually comes from. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's your closest friends and family. It's the people that are rooting for you, your, your dedicated fan base, um, the people you can rely on to, to spread the word, do actual word of mouth marketing. Yeah. It's funny. I, w- I was thinking about back in the, in the nineties, um, when I was trying to get a record deal and all that stuff, I was in Dallas, Texas. And, uh, this is at a time when this is when grunge was just hitting huge. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm dating myself, but Hey, that was the last great rock and roll revolution. It was, <laughs> it was I would, I am glad that I was part, I was there at least to witness it all. But when I think of street teams, And this is one of the mistakes that I think my band at the time that we made, there was a, in Dallas, there still is an area of town called Deep Ellum. And it was three streets where they had like all the hot clubs where all the bands would play. And there was like four or five bands playing every night. And they're all original acts. There was a band called the Toadies that got signed out of there, uh, Tripping Daisy. There was some other big bands that came from there. But when I think of street teams... Like it was literally, it was a battle of the the posters, the gig posters, you know? Yeah. So there was like a, a telephone pole that had nothing but staples in it. And, and you know, and these guys <laughs> would just come on and, and they'd staple their posters about their band gig. And you'd always yeah. have to, we had these posters with, remember that guy, remember that movie Alien? Yeah. Uh, the guy that made that, des- the design for Alien came from a guy named MC Escher. He was a guy that made these really super creepy, like alien images and stuff. And I think that inspired the alien movie or maybe, I I don't know which came first. But so we put like these real super creepy, like we were a metal band, you know, Uh we were like hard alternative. And, um, but they were, you know, typically they were your buddies, right? It wasn't, you know, and, and in the beginning, so, you know, what I noticed with a lot of those bands that succeeded back then, I mean, cause it's hard getting people to show up for your gigs, man, yeah. you know, and sp- when you're the first band that starts at eight o'clock when nobody's <laughs> even out, you know, they're still having dinner or whatever. Um, and, but they would be your buddies, you know, and they would go out and they'd staple posters to the, to the telephone poles and put flyers on the, on the cars and all that kind of stuff and talk to their buddies about you. Of course, they always wanted to get in for free, you know, which if they're going to do that. I guess they should be yeah. on the guest list, you know, <laughs> and pay the whopping five buck cover to get in. Um, you know, but those are the guys, they would go to the wall for you. Cause you know, you're, you're partying with them on, you know, on, on Friday night and, you know, drinking yeah. some beers or whatever. 
And we didn't, we didn't really, we had some of that relationship with some people, but I noticed that some of the bands that really had it going on, I mean, they worked down there, like their day jobs. They were the guy with the nose ring that worked at the record store, you know, and he was in the cool band that played that last Saturday night that opened yeah. for, you know, I mean, cause Nirvana played there, um, back when they were coming through town, you know, in their wow. early days. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. It was, it was a scene, Definitely. man. Um, but anyway, it's, I, it's funny. I even... Even over the past couple of years, though, I've seen people doing that same thing, posting their flyers on telephone poles all around right. Nashville. And it oh, makes really? a, I think it's made a big difference for certain artists. You know, if they actually if, if they have like in groundwork, the other preceding steps kind of uh, going in motion first. But if, if they're doing that, too, I've, I've noticed that, that it'll work, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, because people want to be part of something that's that's special, you know, they want it with, you know, they're curious about things. And I mean, and I, I also, you know, I have to say that the biggest thing that's, that's worked for us as a band, I mean, you just got to have an excellent music video. I mean, we've, we've had, we have one song yeah. that I'll probably, you know, until sales stop, you know, or still I start losing money on a regular basis, I'm just going to keep promoting this one music video. Of course I'll post others, mm-hmm. but there's no reason to stop. I mean, but the key is we have the song called love shine that blew up for us. And, you know, but the music video, in fact, I got great advice from a consultant, um, named Carl Hitchborn. I got to throw a, a shout out to, to Carl. He said, you know, cause he, I was consulting with him at the time about what my music video should do. And I had this concept video planned out and all this, and all this thing. And he was like, dude, so you've already told me that you're like a great live band, right? You're known for your live show. Right. I'm like, Yeah. Yeah. And he said, would your fans come out if you did a music video and just played live? I'm like, yeah. It's like, do that. Definitely. And, <laughs> and that's what we did, man. And we captured lightning in a bottle for that music video. We had all these people are just down front. You know, it looks like the most exciting show ever. And yeah. it was. I mean, I was there. It was like, and we're not even playing live or lip syncing. Yep. But we told those people that came, it was on a Sunday afternoon. We just had this venue that we had a good relationship with. They let us film the video. And we just told them, it was like, all right, guys, you're on camera. Let's, you know, <laughs> let's, let's freak out, you know, uh-huh. and they did. And it was so cool. And, and it, and it comes off in the music video. Yeah. So when people watch it, they're like, man, this band, this song is rocking. That crowd looks like they're having the time of their life. Definitely. That's what we capture. Cause that's really what our band is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it's like, um, yeah. So I think a music, a, a really good music video that just, matches the th- matches the song and you gotta have a, plus you gotta have a great song definitely you know um you know and if and if, even if you're like a cover band i mean dude you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot if you put out a crappy video you know some video that you took at some lame gig that you had at some you know some shithole bar you know on on an iphone you put that out on facebook you're just you know, broadcasting how bad you suck. You you just want to, you know, not to be <laughs> negative, but I've seen a lot of that kind of thing going on. I mean, it's like yeah, a, a, a great music. Like we, I was in a band that played nothing but weddings for about two and a half years. And in Florida, the wedding market is huge, you know, because people mm-hmm. do those beach weddings and stuff. For sure. We had one music, one video where we sang a bunch of different genres and that video booked well over a hundred thousand dollars worth of gigs just for us. Wow. And dude, we were lip syncing the whole thing. The tracks, <laughs> the tracks that we're using were karaoke tracks. Uh-huh. The thing isn't even legit. And, and you know, it got a hundred thousand dollars worth of sales. So that would be my advice to artists is you got to have a good music video to spend the money. Um, yeah, okay. So, okay. So let's, again, I'll, I'll go off on rabbit trails. Let's talk about releasing music. So okay. the big question, how often should an artist release music and why? That is totally I, I really struggled with, I don't know if you read that section of the book, but that I really struggled with defining a specific, you know, frequency of releasing music in the book, because I think it's different for every artist and artists have different budgets that they can't record themselves and they need to hire a producer, um, a recording engineer. I think it's really just getting into the habit of writing often. Um, building that habit and definitely, I mean, don't be afraid to release imperfection. I think a lot of artists release music just a couple times a year because they're very self-conscious about how people are going to approach that song. 
And I think yeah. if, if you're releasing music in general, if, if it's pretty often, if it's like once a month, for example, or a couple of times a month, um, which is a lot, that's, that's a lot of releases if you're singles. Um, but even just once a month, then I, I think that's great. Um, even once every couple of months, that's, that's better than just two times a year, you know? But I think, I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to just build, build the habit of writing pretty often so that you have those songs in your back pocket. And then, I mean, if you can re- record yourself, then record as much as you can with your schedule. Um, if you have to pay a producer, then just budget accordingly. If it, find a cheaper producer, if yours is charging up the wazoo, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, man, I've, it is kind of a hard topic because yeah. like I talked to the uh, their great band called the cold stairs I talked to their drummer. They're, um, they're kind of like Royal blood. They've got a, you know, kind of a two, two member band, but I talked to them and I said, you it seems like you're releasing a song every month. How are you doing that? And he was just like, well, that's basically our album that we recorded in Nashville. We recorded 12 tracks and we're just slowly releasing them over time, yeah. you know, and then we'll, and they have like this album release that's upcoming and, and all that kind of thing. And I think they'll do some extra, you know, like bonus tracks or something like that when they release the album that's not available to uh, online or what have you. But, you know, so I noticed they were staying real, you know, it's just like, well, that's just the way things are done now, man. You know, yeah. and, and he was kind of with me. He was just like, you know, back in the day, you just waited for the band's album to come out. And you <laughs> couldn't wait. You know, you went and got bought the CD and you looked at the cover. And you, I, I you confess that I don't have it yet, but I'm I'm waiting on Sgt. Pepper, the vinyl, to come in the mail. It nice. should be coming this week. Oh, nice. But <laughs> because it's one of my favorites of all time. But yeah. I, I definitely agree. We're in we're in such a singles driven market now um th- doing something like that if you have a whole album prepared just roll it out in singles first um you're gonna keep people's attention longer and then you'll have the full product there on spotify or on online on your website to sell in the form of a vinyl or a cd so definitely yeah and then at a, an early podcast interview i did i can't remember the guy's name but at this point but um you know, he was just like, he honestly kind of, you know, the, the, the monthly single release strategy, he's just like, look, I didn't know what I was doing, but I told myself that if I can't, if I'm trying to be a write music full time and I can't release one song a month, right. would know how you put it. I can't write three minutes of music a month, but I need to, I need to start doing something else, <laughs> you know? And I thought, well, that's kind of hitting below the belt a little bit, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's really the truth. And then it was another thing that a a guy had said um, that really kind of stuck with me. Now, he was talking about sync placements, but it kind of the principle behind this statement really applies across the board. He said, he said, you know, I can't control how many sync placements I get. Mm -hmm. That's up to someone else, you know, to to make that final decision, whether or not my song is going to be on their TV show or what have you. But what I can control is how many people I pitch essentially, or, you know, or how many, I mean, you could, if you really think about that, you break it down to the ridiculous. It's like, I can control how many hours that I spend every week or every, you know, how many minutes per day I spend writing songs that I will eventually send to somebody and say, there's sure. a song I just did. Yeah. You can, I can control, control the that. persistence. Yeah. You can control exactly. the persistence, but you can't necessarily control the results, but the more persistence is going to probably translate to more results eventually. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can't really, can, and, and, and I think where the songwriting thing, cause I run into this issue is, is like about the, the whole, the muse, you know, does the muse show up? Mm-hmm. Well, the muse might show up more often if I sit in front of that keyboard that's sitting over there Yeah, <laughs> and I just start playing some stuff or if I yeah. sit down with my bass and start working on a groove, you know, yeah. maybe the muse is waiting for me to invite it to play, you know? Um, my buddy the other day said that he, I mean, he's making it a point. This is one of his new, you know, his new habits he's trying to implement is just 30 minutes a day. He's going to sit down and whether it's song ideas, just concept ideas, if it's just a little bit of a verse, if it's just a melody, a chord progression, he just wants to try writing for 30 minutes every day. And what's going to happen is that's not going to end up being just 30 minutes most of the time. Most of the time you're going to end up sitting there for longer and coming up with a lot more than just one idea. So, yeah, I mean, just yesterday I, I had, well, I tell you what I did. I started, um, 
I had these drum beats. Somebody put out a, uh, I think it was, was it Clyde Stubblefeld? He's the, the, one of the former drummers for James Brown. It was actually kind of false advertising. It said it was like funk drum beats. It wasn't. He's playing, but they had, there was one cool rhythm that was going. And so I came up with this chord progression and I was just letting the drums take me somewhere. Yeah. And sure enough, you know, I sat there and I, I wrote a, I wrote a hook and I took the, I took my, this trusty microphone, put it in my wife's closet, which is also my vocal booth and, you know, started laying down some lyrics. I had a direction on the lyrics that I was uh, of, a you know, some books that I've been reading lately kind of gotten that, you know, frame of mind. I had a topic to write about. Yeah. So it, it, it just, but it started with a drum beat. I like that. Ooh, that's got a good groove. And I laid down a bass groove and it was like, yeah, it just the whole thing. And, you know, but it all started with me. I, I got up early. I got up like five o'clock in the morning because our dog was barking. Definitely. And I just sat myself in front of the computer and just started listening to that drum beat and going, I, okay, I think I can work with this. Yeah. It starts with developing a habit. That's for yeah, sure. Absolutely. So let's, um, so now you got your song written. Oh, wait, I'm falling backwards. So now we got our song written. We've got our music video. Let's talk about marketing. Yeah. What kind of marketing in your experience is the most effective and why? So definitely I would say, and, and groundwork for artists, you know, as a whole is marketing. For instance, I mean, even, even the branding stuff, that's, you know, you can't market anything if you don't have a brand. Um, I would say recently, earned marketing, so the content and actually proactively engaging is going to work the best because it's going to result in actual fans. Mm -hmm. um, past that, what I put, what I roll out in the book is social media ads. Um, so Facebook, so actual paid, actually paid, paid advertising. Yeah, actual paid advertising. Um, so social media ads on Facebook and Instagram. Um, you know, you can do Google ads if you want to, for instance, if you want to, if you want to direct people, if they search for your artist name and you want them to go straight to your merch page, for example, um, then you can do some Google ads for your merch page specifically. Um, yeah. but mainly what I'm talking about in the book is social media ads like Facebook and Instagram, um, directed at a specific audience. Yeah, I, that's, and I have to speak to this. I mean, well, for one, I, I created a Facebook ads for music course. I don't know if you saw it on our page, but, yeah. um, it's free and you know, this is a shameless plug for a free thing. So in a way that's not shameless, is it? But it's actually, you know, I have, and, and I got to just back up what you're saying because Facebook ads have been absolutely incredible for us. Um, I'm spending $150 a day right now on Facebook ads. Um, now, people hear that number and they're like, Oh my God, you must be rich. I'm like, no, because that means I'm making at least 151 every single day within mm -hmm. sales. I don't, you know, it actually makes a lot more than that. And you know, this, there's a lot to this, but don't let that freak you out. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm saying is I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to say I can afford to spend 150 bucks a day with the, with the funnel that I have in place because I'm making well more than that. But most importantly, I've been gay. I have six between six and 7,000 people that have bought our CD around the country. Mm -hmm. And I've also used the same strategy to get people to download our music. I've used a strategy like gangbusters to do sell tickets to live shows yeah. because the thing that's so amazing about Facebook ads. And again, this is in the free course. Just go to musicmoney.tv If you want to sign up for the free course, it's Facebook ads for music. There's like 12 modules in there. I walk you through step by step. It doesn't sell anything else. It's not some, you know, kind of weird back end thing for us to get you to sign up for something. It's just, I gave it away for free. I actually had every intention of selling it. I made it about a year ago. Now I'm just like, I'll give it away for free just to get people great content. Um, so I walk you through how we do the tickets, all that kind of stuff. But the thing that's so amazing about Facebook is that when the algorithm takes over and figures out who will buy your, I mean, not just who will download your stuff for free, as for who will whip their credit card out or go to their PayPal account and give you money for something. Yeah. It figures that out. They're good. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, it's it really goes good. crazy. So I've been using what are called lookalike audiences. And I know you talk about that in the book. Lookalike audiences are what F Facebook goes, okay, here's a thousand people that took the action that you said that you wanted. Like they wanted to buy something or they wanted to click on this or whatever. Oh, we have 
2.5 million people that fit those exact profiles. They have over a thousand data points on every single person that has a Facebook account. They know everything, and I mean everything. Every website you go to, you might want to close a few tabs there. That's all, just what I'm saying. Uh, you know, they know everything where you're going and they know if you're likely to buy music or if you're likely to download it for free and they know every, and, and it really is. And so like sometimes on Reddit, I'll have these people ask questions like, I don't know what my music sound like. I know people always say that, but I don't know what I sound like. And I, what do you suggest? And I say, you got to have somebody that you think is, sounds a little bit like, just yeah. go with that artist, give Facebook an idea because your whole goal is to build a lookalike audience. If they say like, you know, you've got a music video to this weird song that you think doesn't sound like anybody, maybe it sounds a little like Radiohead. Okay, perfect. Radiohead, a few other artists, and then just let the algorithm start figuring out who's responding to your your video and it will find people that will like your music. Definitely. It's amazing. And, that's, and I want to back up to what you said on top of that is the sales funnel thing. And that's exactly what, you know, my premise writing groundwork for artists was is if you, cause sure you can do the, the social media ads, but just to amp that up even more, if you do have a solid brand in place and mm. your ecosystem is connected so that that ad directs you to the right place and that can direct you to your music. So you yeah. can stream it or you can purchase it and you're putting out awesome content. So they're going to follow you because of that after they see your ad. I mean, you are, you really are priming yourself for success and it's going to make that those look like audiences worth it. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. So now that we've, so really, I mean, I, I really, your, your book really does a great job of just kind of encapsulating the most important things. These are the things to focus on. There's so many other things you can get so distracted with, but, but you know, it's just creating content on a regular basis, releasing on a regular basis, creating connections with those fans, engaging, um, you know, advertising the right, the high, the high quality content. Um, now you kind of, it seemed like you sort of ended with live shows. What, uh, do you find it that you have a lot of artists to run into that haven't done live shows or don't really know much about that or what's. Yeah, it's funny. And I had a feeling that you would ask about this, by the way, um, because a lot of people do in live shows by putting it tense in the steps, uh, in, in the blueprint, I'm not saying to wait until all of these other steps are complete until you start booking and playing live shows. But I guess what I'm trying to say when I put it at the end is um, if you do these preceding nine things first, it is going to put yourself in the position to actually sell tickets and yeah. fill a venue. Um, if you are, you know, if you have a solid brand, you're attracting people to become followers so that they're seeing when you are playing live shows or when you're touring, um, if you're doing social media ads that are specifically for your live show. Um, you know, all those sorts of things kind of play into selling tickets in the end and yeah. actually filling a venue. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I get that all the time. I mean, cause our band has never toured and now I'm really, you know, like we've sold six, 7,000 CDs around the country. I'm, I'm like, yeah, you know, maybe we should just tour Texas, you know, because there's a lot of big cities in Texas or even Ohio. There's a lot of big cities in Ohio. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, do you think that's a valid thing? Do you think artists should still tour in an age where they can just live stream? And what do you think about that? You know, I would say that it's definitely I think that an artist should perform live. And whether that comes to touring, that's, I think that kind of progresses. Um, but it, at the end of the day, it goes back to step one of the blueprint. If, if that's their goal, you know, a mm. lot of, look at the Beatles, for example, yeah, I brought up the Beatles. They started off performing live strictly and putting out albums to go along with those, those shows and tours, but then they just wanted to record. That was their goal was just be in the studio. Um, so I think if it's an artist's goal to perform live, and I, I personally think it should be, um, then eventually they are going to get to the point where more people are going to want to see them. And so they are going to have to tour. Um, I definitely agree. Start in your bubble and then kind of expand from there. Look at your, your analytics on Instagram and look at your target marketing results on Facebook to see where your fans are. Look at who's 
buying CDs, like, like you were mm-hmm. saying, and go to those cities. Um, and then definitely, but no matter what with live shows, I always tell artists just rehearse, 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 brand the show. Otherwise it's just going to be a dud. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's that thing of, cause that's definitely stuff that I also caught from your book. It's like you have one chance to make a first impression. We always hear that, but things like broken links or, um, you know, social media profiles that haven't been, you know, it's like a ghost town when you go there, you, you know, you mo- look at the, and, and people do that. I mean, you judge, you know, I, I definitely see that, you know, like, um, there's an artist that I, Marcus King. I don't know if you've Mar- if you've heard Marcus King, great blues guitar player. He's got a <clears throat> one of the best new albums that I've heard in in many years. Um, but I find myself going to his social media now. He's definitely one of these guys that 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 posts a lot more on Instagram than he does on Facebook. Um, but there's no real reason for that. Plus, he also has a record label too. And I'm kind of I find yeah. myself judging his record label like why don't you guys put the same content on Facebook? Why, when I go to your Facebook profile, does it look like it's the bastard stepchild of Instagram, which you know, <laughs> posts in five, you could, all you got to do is click the button to cross post. And, and a, you may be listening to this or watching this and you don't realize that you can use a tool that Facebook provides called creator studio. Um, and I would, well, if you have a Facebook page, you can use it. You don't have to, it's not about advertising. It's just, it's a cool tool that you can use that will post, um, you can easily post cross post, I guess is what they would call it. You know, your, your content on Instagram will automatically update your Facebook page as well. Because guys like me, I'm on Facebook a lot more often than I am on Instagram, you know, but if it's just a click of a button, why not cross post? You know, it just makes you look like you're on top of things. And that's, that's what you're saying is that, that, you know, things like broken links or not having, you know, stuff that works, yeah. Those are little things. They're, they're ticky tacky and they drive you nuts. And that's, that's the thing I've always said about being a marketing professional is that I didn't realize it becoming a, you know, cause I'm a copywriter by trade. That's my, you know, I just like to write and write persuasive copy. Uh, I didn't realize I had to be a tech nerd and geek to go along with it. You know, yeah. it's like everything right now requires technology. Um, and I am going to do a shameless plug for our upcoming app that we're developing. That's what the Music Money TV podcast is about, is um, we're actually developing a fan club app to make it easy for fans or for, for artists to have fan clubs um, and not be super techie. Just click click the button and, and get it done. But, um, well, I tell you what, Levi, you have been a great guest. I really appreciate um, some of the insights and some of the conversations that we've had. Um, once again, kind of, if you would just encapsulate your book again, let's give us the title again and where's the best place to get it and to learn more about you. How, how do people get a hold of you? Yeah, definitely. So the book is called Groundwork for Artists. It's a 10 step guide to organic growth in today's music industry. Um, you can get it on Amazon in paperback or Kindle version. Um, and you can follow me at Levi Burwell on Instagram. That's basically the only one I'm on right now. Uh, but yeah, I'd appreciate if you check the book out. I think all artists can get a lot of value and de-stress from, from reading it and following the steps. Nice. And I have to second that. I did, I did read through it, albeit quickly. I did read through it, though. I, I can speed read. Um, and, and it really does have some great stuff in there. And I, I plan on using it myself to kind of go in and, and like, okay, Barry, this is, you know, we got to get our, our marketing act together here and shore up the things that you, I pretty much know that I should do. But again, if you, if you hear things, you don't act on them, what good is it? Yeah. You know? So, um, again, thanks so much, Levi. We really appreciate having you on the podcast and best of luck to you. Thanks. so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Barry. 